this is a little bit too loud. <coughs> so welcome to day two Campus Party Europe on the Archimedes stage. Topic, security, networking. Today is going to be also a very, so yesterday it was a very exciting uh, day. I had a lot of really good talks and uh, so we keep on doing this today. We're going to start with um, to be, uh, with um, <coughs> Tobias van Ingen from uh, HP Networks. He will talk about uh, networks. What else do we have today? We have free software cloud data storage with Frank Kari Karicek. He's on uh, after lunch. We have actually two ladies on stage today in the afternoon. Jennifer Perry, she will talk about cyber stalking and Karen Elazari, she will talk about women in tech. But first, let's talk, let's talk, no, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about defining our networking future. It's all about the apps. Welcome, Tobias van Ingen. Thank you. So, I hope I can follow myself, because, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Because there is a, I hear a lot of different sounds to each other, but um, so they asked me to present um, what HP's vision is about where the network future is going and why we think that future is moving ahead. So I think we need to take one step back before discussing the future of networking. Is that If you're looking at the networking, it's just an underlying architecture to run a service or to run an application, right? And the application is a service to the end user in the end. So if we're looking at the future of the networking, we need to look at the way the development of the application is going and make sure that the future of the networking is aligned to the to the applications we are deploying. So, if you're looking at the agenda of the presentation, when we do a vision inside HP and when we set a new strategy of new products, it doesn't matter if a new vision on networking, we first look at demographics and macro forces, right? That, that, that are really quickly reshaping our world. So we will go through these macro forces and um, then the next step is that we're going to look at the next generation, is what we call the network trends and drivers, to see what are the trends and drives that are driving these micro forces forward in a networking world. Then we're going to look at software-defined networking, because that's the big trend moving forward in networking. And we, we have developed something that's called OpenFlow, and we will look what OpenFlow will mean for us in a networking uh, and HP in a company. And the last part is where we're getting it a little bit back to earth and where we already have an application. This is the first step we have. It's virtual application networking. It's the first step in software-defined networking. So if we're looking at the macro forces, let's start with the population growth. By 2025, the current population is around 6.6 .6 billion people on the planet. By 2025, the population will roughly grow by 20% moving to 7.8 billion people. This is not the most important figure that we get out of this, but the most important figure of the population growth is that if you're looking at where the people growth will be. So the people growth of the younger people will be in what we call the emerging markets. That's the Middle East and that's Africa, that's Brazil. So that, that's, the, uh, that's the growth where the, uh, of the younger people will be. Meaning the technology in these areas will be adopt much quicker, right? They will adopt technology much quicker and they will take connectivity for granted. In the more developed world where we are living in, like, like Germany, like, like the Western Europe part, like the US, you will see a growing population of elder people. And this growing population of elder people, we need to make sure that we deliver the right quality of service and support inside the products and inside the different packages we have from a support portfolio. So, the next figure is urbanization. And urbanization is where you see people getting bigger and bigger, where, where you see cities getting extending. And cities will extend annually by 16 million people, it's like adding a Beijing to the planet every month. So, important factor there is that if you're looking at an infrastructure, and you take just a physical infrastructure, right, you need to make sure you can scale up with the roads, the water, the electricity, etc. And from an IT standpoint, in a new world, in a new economic where everybody can work, work everywhere and get a service from everything 
uh, as a service, you need to make sure that the IT infrastructure, the connectivity, the mobile internet, desktop internet, etc., is ready in these in these cities, able to scale up this urbanization. Then the next point is information explosion. I on purpose use some older figures to see how big it already was in 2010. We, the whole planet, created 988 exabytes of new content, just new content. To put it in perspective, one exabyte is around 50,000 year of DVD video quality. Then, in, in, in the US, the CITA is measuring the amount of text messages sent every half. And in the second half of 2009, there was a big trend in text messaging, a huge trend. And in, that, in the US only, they send around 740 text messages a half. That boils down to around, what is it, 170 text messages a month, 2.1 million million per hour, something like that. It's, I think it's around 48,000 text messages being sent in the US only in 2009 every second. So that can be business, that can be private, it doesn't matter, but we need to make sure that we can track it if it is business, that we can meet our regularity compliancy, etc. Another point about information explosion, and that's why I use older figure, is that every 12 to 18 months, this doubles. So the text messages doubles, the content will double. And then the market. The market is, you see a lot of companies investing in cloud apps, in tablets, in, in phones. And the main reason is that the market of the, of the mobile internet is 10 times the size as the market of the desktop internet. So, these figures taken aside, let's take it a little bit more in 2022, let's say to the IT world. And we will have in 2020, we have roughly will have 25 million applications. We will have, currently we have 2 billion people connected to the internet, that will be 4 billion people by 2020. We will have more than 31 billion devices connected to the internet. And we will have around 450 billion online interactions each day. So if we take the 7.8 billion people, I know there is a five years time difference there. But if, the, if we take these people, and you have 450 billion interaction divided by 7.8, meaning every person every day has at least 57 interactions on the internet a day. And if you take that 7.8 people and you take the 31 billion connected devices, meaning that every person on the planet has four devices connecting to the internet. So these four devices can be either privately owned or can be publicly owned or can be you know, owned by a company. But we need to make sure that how are we going to deliver the right content to the right device? How are we going to deliver, how are we going to determine, for example, the quality of service, the security, et cetera, to all these different devices? And four billion people, I said two, so we're going to four billion people. So we even have on per person maybe even more devices um, on, the, on the planet. So digital native, we did a research. The digital na native people are everybody under the age of 28. Everybody above the age of 28, that's me. So we call digital immigrants. So how many people are under the age of 28 in this group? So that, that's a lot. So everybody above the age of 28 is what we call a digital immigrant. And they are using technology a complete different way. They have a complete different view on technology than underneath this age. And the digital native, we did a research about how they are using their smartphone and their, uh, their mobile phone. And so think about the two, two, two questions there. How many text messages do you think digital native people will send? And how many minutes on voice talk do you think they will have? So if I want to discuss a subject with you, I'm going to give you a phone call. Right? And if you are not there, I'm going to leave you a voicemail message asking to returning my call. A digital native people is working completely different with communication. They send around 4,072 text messages on average each month. And they have around 17 minutes of talking time on the phone. And what turns out, these 17 minutes of talking time on the phone is more related to listen to their voicemail of all the digital immigrant people, leave them a voicemail. So this is an important factor of communication change. Then we have the acceleration of innovation and change. Where we had in the past, we had the mainframe world. Then we moved to the client server, 
we moved to the internet and now we're moving in this mobile, social, big data, cloud world. Right? And if you're looking at the way we are changing and we can accelerate the innovation, how fast innovation is adopted, look at the way every 60 seconds, around 98,000 tweets are posted. More than 200,000 minutes of Angry Birds are played every 60 seconds, right? These figures are huge and, 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 and really, really fast. What, what gives them the opportunity is really, this will deliver a new business model. And in particular for the networking, the way they need to scale up is massive. If, if something becomes successful, it accelerates really, really fast. So this is really important for us. The big advantage is the last point, right? Because the acceleration and change is going so fast, it removes every inhibitor, right? It's really giving the power for innovation. So, let's give you an example about how fast these things are going. I don't know if everybody knows America Online, but America Online took nine years to get one million users. Facebook took nine months to get the first one million users. There is now an application named something, it's Draw Something, right? You can, you, it's for your kids and you can play, you can draw something. It took them nine days to get the first one million users. And these nine days, you need to make sure that your infrastructure is ready, that you scale up, and that you can keep on delivering your service. Because we accelerate very fast, but you also drop something very fast. If it's not available, we, we tend to stop using it. So. These are, let's say, the generic macro forces and demographic figures we are using to see, okay, where should we go up with the, in with the infrastructure and where is the future going? If you're going a little bit back and look at the networking trends and drivers underneath this, is where you see that we have a complete change in traffic inside the data center. 75% of the traffic inside your data center is going machine to machine. So, we're always in the past, always the end user was the end of the communication channel, right? The end user was asking something, the application was giving something back. And we, we have a complete way, and that's why I said it's all about the application. Because we're getting a complete way of deploying applications by, by the measured, what we call federated applications. I think everybody knows Google Maps. And if you, if you, if you search, for example, to this place on Google Maps, 25 applications will start talking to each other, giving you one single response. In order to do that, to scale it, to have some diversity, to have a distributed approach. So 25 applications, and this is the way why did these traffic patterns are changing inside a data center and applications will start talking to each other. Another trend is where you see virtualization in the data center. That can be either virtual desktop or, or it can, can be just virtual servers. If you're looking at the virtual service first, and you're looking at the way virtual servers are behaving, and the dynamics you have, for example, you say, okay, there is a certain load, or I need more memory, or I know I'm going to have a marketing program, and I need to run additional of these web servers, for example, then vMotion, for example, will transit automatically these servers for you. So they will, just without user intervention, just policy driven. And the meaning that these servers are communicating with each other and a lot of data is going back and forth. Another thing if you have VDI solutions, in VDI it's even worse because in VDI your desktop is also running inside your data center and the applications that he's needed is also inside your data center. So you also have much more data center traffic. So this is very important for us to make sure, okay, how are we going to deal with the data center architectures? Then Gardner did a research is that, okay, how many servers will be virtualized, right? How many virtualized workloads do we get in the future? So by the end of 2012, I think every application roughly inside there, we will have roughly about 50% virtualized workloads. And by the end of 2013, this will be around 75%. So the last point here is that, is there's nothing changing in the campus land? In the campus land, we will see that we are moving around 25% of the traffic will be video. And this will be used either for collaboration, for consumerization, or for training purposes. But traffic, and if you take um, technologies like Skype and Microsoft Link and this kind of technology, also are not communicating directly anymore with servers. They are communicating directly with endpoints, right? There is a setup in between them and then there, has an, there is a communication between them. It's meaning that even inside your campus land, there is a lot of 
more what we call east to west instead of north to side kind of traffic. And this is need to change your designs and need to change the networking components. So what has really changed? The skill and the size of the networking are exploded because of the fast acceleration of new services. And, and the expectation of the user, how fast the service should be deployed in the, in the network is really, really fast. Because they are getting used to these draw something application that they can just click and have the application. Then there are a lot of specialized appliances where you will see that these will be less in the future. The main reason is they cannot go up or they are really expensive. Because if you have a specialized appliance, you're building it with specialized hardware, specialized ASIC, etc. And the cost of these appliances are really high and they are very difficult to go up in the future. So, and there is no differentiated parameter anymore in the network. So even if you are a user, so I'm 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 working for EMEA, and I'm but I'm I think that it has been three months since I have been in, in my own HP office, right? And that's in the Netherlands in Amsterdam. I'm traveling everywhere, and either I'm uh, if I am back home, I'm working from my home office. So the parameter is gone. A new user should get the service from every time, anywhere. So the meaning, we have to deliver everything as a service. And inside the data center, we see these different traffic patterns. So meaning the speed is increasing inside the data center. That's where we really need to work something else with. So let's look at why the network architect has issues, right? It's inefficiency. And inefficiency is cost, simple as that. Inefficiency, we have high workloads, we have very specialized appliances where you need special support contracts, special knowledge, and very expensive hardware. Then the next thing is complexity. If I look, I have three boys, so I have three sons. And if I, I look at my three sons and the way they are working with technology, and if I am configuring a switch at home, they think I'm completely nuts, right? Doing something from CLI, something else. But the problem is, is that these boys become the next generation of our system administrators and the next generation of our networking administrator. So we need to make sure that we get rid of the complexity inside the networking. The other thing is that making a configuration mis mistake in the current network infrastructures is huge. And the, 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 the impact on the security level and the impact on the uptime of the network is big, in particular, when you are concentrating everything in a, in a data center, where all your services start to tend running. Rigidity is that a lot of companies have static SLAs, right? They have static contracts or static agreement with users. But the way with the new applications and the way this accelerate, we should change this and we need to, you will see a more coming behavior to a more dynamic agreement with users, with end users and so more dynamic SLAs. So, then let's take it a little bit more to the hardware. So in the past, we had a hardware, and on that, on the, there was some servers, some storage, some networking, and there was an application, and we have information running on that particular server. Then the next evolution was where we, where VMware and these kind of companies came along and said, okay, we're going to virtualize the hardware, and we will get slices of service virtualized running on top of this hardware. But still, the application and the information is attached to the server. You cannot put the application anywhere, anytime you want. So the next step is where you see is where we're getting in a converged world. And in this converged world, they say, okay, we're going to, um, uh, let's say, virtualize or make one adapter for storage and networking. And this is where we say we get a converged world. The main reason for doing that is, is having a, a cost, right? Cost reduction inside the server because you can get rid of your expensive HPAs and you can do it with a single networking card. As HP, we are very, very, very cautious on this technology. We do it, we only do it in a single hop infrastructure. The main reason is if you think about this 988 exabyte in 2010 and put this now on top of the network, we have an even bigger issue already, right? Because of the scalability, etc. So we are very cautious. We do it in a single hop because we, you can then reduce the cost in the edge and then you can do the rest uh, uh, on the fiber channel LAN and on the LAN, for example. So you can also respect the current silos there are. But do we win a lot with this? 
you know, we don't win except of a cost saving. The next step, and this is where our main, I think, HP investment will be, is where we say, okay, we need to get rid of the connection between the application and the information attached to a server. So the only thing we can do that is we have blades of servers connected to each other or data centers connected to each other and virtualize the data center as a whole. The issue we have right now is cost, right? Extending the electronic backplane between servers is very costly. So we are working on developments at what we call there, you see there the optical backplane, working with companies like Intel to extend the backplane of a server, connect them directly to each other. And if we can do this, we already can do it, but the cost is too high to put it in a real enterprise grade solution. But I think the coming couple of years, you will see that we will bring out the solution of optical backplane, connecting blade enclosures to each other, or maybe complete data center to each other, then you can virtualize the whole data center as a whole entity instead of a server. And this way, you can deattach the application information from a particular server. You can more or less just drop it on-site your data center infrastructure. So if we do this, and I'm not sure how everybody is in cloud, but if you take an example from a cloud infrastructure and think about you are an enterprise company, and you're going to use a public cloud, and you're going to use some Google mailboxes, and you're going to use your Microsoft Link or your Office 365, for example, directly from the cloud, and you're going to build an independent cloud where you're going to really protect and host your production data, for example. That's meaning you get three sources from two public clouds and one independent cloud. How are you going to make sure that the user is getting this service and you know, wherever he wants to have this service. And how are you going to make sure that you as a company can meet the regularity compliance, you can meet the security settings, and can set the right quality of service to a public cloud or to an independent cloud. And this is where I think we will discuss this a little bit longer, but this is where we need to let, let's say we need to move to a more coordinated service delivery model. And the port or the wireless access point or the port or the VPN or whatever kind of connectivity point the user is connecting to should become the avatar of the user. And the avatar of the user meaning it should know which kind of services the user wants to attach to and what the priority settings for this user are. So if you deploy something in your cloud that you need to attach it to the, to the, uh, to the user, but you can, you can deliver a new service inside your cloud very, very fast. But if it's not attached to the user, there is no sense of using it, in particular in public cloud, right? You need to make sure you can do the right security, you can do the right quality of service, et cetera, to all your different services you start to running. So the port of the user should have the intelligence to understand this and should be able to detect the behavior of the user. So how are we going to get there? Uh, if you're looking at the generic rule of change, and if you want to do things better, right? You want to do things 5% of less better, the generic rule is that you say, okay, I'm going to optimize things that I'm doing, and then I, I will reach my 5% better. But if you really, really need to do things 5% or more, or 20% or more better, you need to do, start doing things differently. To give you an analogy, I was at a presentation where there was an Olympic swimmer, and that Olympic swimmer was all his life, he did the, the butterfly stroke, all his life he was second uh, behind somebody else. And he was Canadian, and the one that was first was somebody from the US. The problem was that every time they started to train, right? The guy from Canadian started to train, and the other one started to train. And they train more or less equally as hard. They did an investigation, they trained equally as hard. So the one that was already better became 3 to 4% better. The other one that was already second became more or less the same 3 to 4% better. So he was never able to beat the other one. And there was a time, there was before his final Olympics, he said, okay, I need to do things different, right? I cannot keep up with this because the other one is becoming the same, is, is equally become better than me. So he was, one day he was training, 
and there was somebody sitting in the audience doing complete different swimming sport and they said to him you need to stay longer on the water right longer on the water to get more efficiency out of every stroke you do so you get less strokes and each stroke you do is getting harder so but it was really hard for him because he swam already 15 years or 20 years of his life so he started to train he had two years before the olympics he started to train things completely different than he did so he also started to train different than the other person was doing. And that final Olympics he swam, that, and that he won the gold medal. The only reason was, there was the only way he can, he did it differently, there was the only way he can get a much better improvement. So that's what we need to do in networking. We need to, to start think differently. And this is why you see a big trend coming in software-defined networking. And this is where everybody, this is not there yet, right? This is something that will come in the future and is just starting you see some applications coming i think if you're looking at the most startup companies in the us is in this era software defined networking right i saw just vmware just bought a company named nicra was a startup in 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 software defined networking so what is software defined networking and where will this bring us so software defined networking is the is it, first of all, it's an architecture. And the way we get there is not 100% clear because we can reach it in multiple angles. But an important factor is, one thing that we want to do with software-defined networking is inside the switch, you have a control plane and you have a data forwarding plane. And we want to extract the control plane out of the switches. And if we get the control plane out of the switches inside a single let's say centralized controller or centralized uh, software program, we have all the intelligence of the network, of the topology, and the ab ability to control the networking in a single application, instead of in all the different switches inside your networking. So the key benefits will be that if you make it in software, you make your network programmable. Another key benefit will be if you get rid of all the control planes inside all these switches, the cost of the switches and the ability of the speed of the switches will go up very, very fast. So we get a lower cost and much more speed in each of single switch. So what will the software-defined networking evolution bring you uh, for the networking industry? So since a lot of people are under the age of 28, so in the past we had multiple mainframe companies. Right, you had, for example, digital. I come from digital, so I started at digital and then I came to Compaq and HP. But in digital, and then you had IBM and you had Sun and you had all, all kinds of companies that were delivering hardware. And on top of that hardware, you had a certain amount of applications that you could run on top of that hardware. If you as a company needed a different application, one and another, one and another application, and, and this vendor was not delivering this application for you, you could not use it. Either you needed to new, buy new hardware. So the innovation was very stiff. And the innovation you would get as a customer was very reluctant on what the vendor was delivering you. So then at a the time we got a company named Intel, right? They start to build named x86 processors. And these x86 processors you got a very, let's say, generic operating system on top of it, like Microsoft or like Linux. And on top of this, you, you, you ha everybody had the ability to create presentations or to create applications. And because you, you give everybody, you open it up and give everybody the ability to create applications, the, the amount of applications and the innovation in the application really was start increasing because it was a complete new business model and the innovation started to happen. And this is what software-defined networking will do for, um, uh, for the networking industry. So, I don't know how many of you heard, but there is a protocol. We are co-developing a protocol named OpenFlow. And OpenFlow is not software-defined networking, but OpenFlow is a protocol that gives you the ability to do software-defined networking. So it is a specification of protocol, it's completely open, it is standardized by a company named, or by, by, an, by an organization named Open Networking Foundation. Companies like Juniper, HP, other kind of companies are part of that. But this is where we set the, stand, the, the, the standards for the OpenFlow protocol. And what, what will OpenFlow give us? 
OpenFlow will give us a generic open standard approach for an API inside the data forwarding plane inside the switch. So it gives us a protocol to communicate with all the different switches inside the data forwarding plane. This is a big advantage. So this is what we call, let's say, the southbound API. Then it also gives you also the ability to build controllers and give them a northbound API. But I'll get back to the northbound API. So why do we think that OpenFlow-based uh, software-defined networking is important? For a couple of factors, because it is open, so it ensures vendor interoperability, right? It's an open standard, and it's the only way we can ensure vendor inter interoperability. The other thing, a lot of vendors already commit to OpenFlow. The other thing for an organization, it makes sure you won't get vendor lock-in. So you will have choose and selection in the future for, for your choice. And then, OpenFlow is completely designed as a protocol, so it's not evolved as a protocol to become a software-defined networking protocol, but it's designed from the ground up to do software-defined networking. And it's designed to create a dynamic and programmable networking for you in the future. So why do why we HP wants to use OpenFlow instead of everybody else can using OpenFlow and can do uh, innovation on it? For HP, OpenFlow is important on our networking for a couple of factors. Simplifying networking management. So I always compare it. I don't know how many, I think there are not a lot of people. If, if you manage a, a wireless LAN inside an infrastructure, there is not a company in the world anymore that's going to configure a single access point. Right? The access points are plugged in the network and there is a controller to it. The access point build up a tunnel and the controller is configuring the access point via these tunnels. And on that controller, you're going to configure multiple services. If you need a new service, you configure the service on the controller and all the access points or, or groups of access points will adopt the service automatically. So in the networking, we're still configuring every single switch from a service standpoint. So think about what we can do with OpenFlow from a management standpoint. And think about how my three boys become maybe later the next generation of networking administrators. We need to simplify this. And we need to make it unified, right? We need to get the same approach for wireless as we have for wired. So this will be, this is why we want to have this. So we want to simplify the network applications with, uh, with OpenFlow. The next thing is we want to have dynamic network ability. So we want to have a network that is able to quickly adapt to these new services that we saw with Draw Something and that we saw with cloud applications. So what is OpenFlow? So OpenFlow is a, is, is, a, is a rule. You have a rule. And based on multiple rules, right, on a port of a switch, on a source destination MAC address, on VLANs, on a, on, or maybe on MPLS, packet text, et cetera, you can do a lot of things, and you can run actions with it. You can forward it to a port, you can forward it to some, uh, some other things, or you can forward it into tunnels, you can redirect, and you can create your own actions. And then you have, of course, the statistics to meet your regularity compliance and to meet, make sure that you can take actions, how many bandwidth, how many statistics are running on certain, on certain flows. So to give you some use cases, I will skip this one because this one is better. We already have uh, multiple demos running where we have a QoS controller. So if you have an, in current networks, if you do quality of service, and you will do, for example, video, then if I having a video conversation with one of you in our network, the traffic comes into a port, the port will classify the traffic as, as for example, video, and it gets a certain priority or maybe even a certain bandwidth inside the network. If at that same time, my CTO or my CIO wants to do a video broadcasting inside our network. The traffic is coming in the port. It's also classified as the same video. So it is very hard to do, let's say, a little bit more of the flow-based quality of service from a controller standpoint. What we can do already with a QoS controller, we have a controller, and inside that controller, we can configure flows. And we can, for example, say, from this time, from, from 9 to 10, somebody is giving a presentation and need to have a higher priority than generic peer-to-peer -peer or one-to-one -one video conversation. We even can do, we can say, okay, we can even say, in order to make sure we are not overwhelming the networking with this complete quality of service, 
we can say no, what we do, this, this quality of service part is to, going to take a certain part inside the network. You configure that on a controller and all the switches will automatically be configured. This is the big advantage of an example. Another example is where you can have much more fine-grained control of your, of your networking infrastructure, where you can do authentication just with generic .1x or MAC authentication or any other type of authentication you want. But the pushing of policies um, and, for example, of quality of service or VLAN policies and the configuration and the dynamics of it, you can push this with, with OpenFlow between vendors, between access points and between switches. And this is, this is a very important example. Another example we did was we did this together with HP Labs. And HP Labs is, um, is a separate organization from all the R&D organizations. So HP Labs more or less can do anything they want and come up with any ideas and, um, and, and be innovative more or less for HP. So what they did is they took OpenFlow as a protocol and see the idea was what it can do from the green initiative inside networking because there's a lot of green initiative inside server storage where you can shut off things and you can lower your CPU, etc. The IEEE had an energy efficient Ethernet and a colleague of mine is, is helping classifying his energy efficient Ethernet. But energy efficient Ethernet is more or less communicating with an endpoint and based on this endpoint you can dynamically, based on the load of the endpoint, you can dynamically reduce the power on a certain networking port because if you're not going full speed, you need less power on your files, etc. So you can reduce the power. So, but what we did here was what we call something research with elastic tree where open flow could be an example. So we said, okay, if we have, if we have traffic inside the network, in this case, we have red traffic taking a certain path inside the network and we have green traffic taking a certain path inside the network. And with OpenFlow, we can reconfigure the paths. So we can let these traffic flows take the same path in the network if there is enough bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. And if we do this, we can even completely turn off all other switches. And this is a much bigger impact on power saving. And also you can do this dynamic. So you can even think, after seven o'clock, maybe nobody is in the company anymore or m multiple people starting to work from a VPN or from something else. We can shut these switches down and really saving power with OpenFlow and automatically turn them back on. So th this, is, this is a project, this is just an example what we can do with the evolution of networking uh, with OpenFlow. So then Carrier has a separate interest in, in OpenFlow than let's say enterprise grade companies. Carrier have interest in OpenFlow because they want to have more speed to market for the cloud infrastructure and they want to have more speed to market for the, let's say, the brands or uh, interconnectivity between customers. And OpenFlow will not only give them more speed to market, but OpenFlow gives them simplified management, lower cost of infrastructure components, and OpenFlow is going to give them um, service differentiation, right? What I said with the flow blaze quality of service and this kind, this is for, an enter, for a service carrier a very big impact because they have a new business model where they can create multiple services on top of it. So, why is us? So we started to work with OpenFlow with Stanford University on a project named Etain and after Etain, Stanford University is using in their product data center OpenFlow. You know, it was moving up as the first commercial switches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so everybody can download it. Um, we helped set up InCenter. InCenter is a test center where multiple vendors can do interoperability between between OpenFlow. Currently, we already have more than 100 companies running OpenFlow, either in the development environment, in a test environment, or in a production environment. So, we we have 16 switches ready for OpenFlow ready for people to test, ready for people to develop, because this is the main point for us, creating use cases, creating development. The only thing is, when will this be really enterprise-grade ready? So, enterprise-grade ready meaning is when you can launch, it's really big time, right? You need to get a certain quality in the product to making sure you can deliver the uptime of your network, deliver the right set of security. So I think there will become a certain part where we had there's a lot of collaboration between companies, networking vendors, it needs to be tested, that's why in-center is set up, 
to deliver the right result and the right outcome of a real end solution. So what was the vision? So where will it go? And now I come back to the northbound API. So first of all, as an infrastructure layer, you need to have either HP or other components that run OpenFlow as a protocol. Yeah, so you need to have infrastructure components and do OpenFlow. On top of that, I think there will be a couple of streams. One stream, of course, is HP separate, but I will let, let me skip that one and come back to that one later. The, one stream will be, and I think this will be most of them, the universities, the service providers, where the stream will be, where people start directly building their own controllers and start directly interfacing with the switches, right? So they're doing both northbound up to the application and southbound up to the switch components. Then you will have another stream, and that's where, where um, companies like HP will build, a, 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 let's say, a default controller. So we have a default controller, and, and that's completely open, so where everybody can do, do the development to the controller. So that you don't have the hardware, you just take a controller, and you do the, you do the development to the controller. That can be either companies that um, want to sell a certain use case, and you can even have multiple applications running on one single controller to do, for example, a particular use model on top of, um, on top of the, uh, the application. Then the other thing is where HP will build a controller and, of course, build our own controller, where we build our own controller and our own applications. So the first step we did in our own applications was because of the cloud delivery expectations. So if you're looking at the mobile internet, I already said 10 times the data, is 1% of the current smartphones are consuming 50% of the internet data. So think about an increase in this area and what we need to do on an infrastructure standpoint. Currently, it takes up to three months for most companies to deliver an application from the cloud and connect it to the end user. So the first, first thing we do is we will see where we have uh, server admins really have a lot of, most of the times have very extensive tools where we, there is a lot of uh, development going on. And the networking admin, th there were, this is not the case. It's very low level, very CLI scripting kinds of components. And what we did is, a, IDC did a calculation for us. If you have 500 components, 500, 500 servers, and each server has 20 virtualized workloads, you get to 10,000 virtualized workloads. If you have five attributes to set per server, it's 50,000 attributes, and on an average, you need five CLI commands. So that's 250,000 CLI commands needed to configure this, right? Let's keep it up and running, and think about the dynamic. Gartner did an investigation. A very, very good network administrator makes one mistake out of a 1,000 commands. So that's still, inside this infrastructure, 250 mistakes being made. That's not simplifying the network infrastructure. The problem is these mistakes are not the problem, but the troubleshooting can start the problem. Where's the mistake made? The whole ticketing process behind it, the whole ETL process. So this is what needs to be changed. So the virtual application networking is making sure, what I said, characterizing the application. So what is the application is needed? You know, what, how can we characterize the application? Set the template for it the VLANs, the quality of service, the security protocols, etc., and then automatically orchestrate it. So it gives us an end-to-end -end control plane across, the, across the, the data center, the, the campus, and the branch networks. Uh, and we can do this, for example, with OpenFlow, with Intelligent Region. And this is really the first small step in software-defined networking. So you can go can create multiple services where the user can be automatically attached to because the application characterization is being done for you. And th also think about the next step and bring your own device, a seamless mobility where you need this kind of characterization. It only gives a new business model, right? And, but I think the business model will be adapted very, very fast. The main reason is because if you're looking at what, what, what happened in the virtual world with VMware, we had a server and VMs, it will be adopted really quickly. So this is the complete picture, is where you virtualize a network, everything comes together in a single controller where you do the characterization, setting the templates and automatic orchestration 
of different services and you can combine even services. You can combine voice, you can combine video, you can combine exchange as business applications. So OpenFlow will, is the key enabler for everybody else to make sure we can do software defined networking. There are switches ready for you to test and, and create and be innovative. So I think the world is changing and are you ready, right? There is an African verb where they say, okay, every, every morning a gazelle wakes up and he needs to start running and he knows he needs to start running faster than the fastest lion, otherwise he will be eaten. And then think, there is a, the lion wakes up and he knows he needs to start running faster than the slowest gazelle in order to not starve to death. So I think start running, right? Because this is the next thing that will happen in networking. This will set the new defined networking because the applications are changing. So start running with us and everybody can be innovated in this. This is a real big challenge. So I want to thank you. I don't know if there are any questions on OpenFlow or something. Run with the mic. Thank you. So you said OpenFlow will be an open protocol and uh, different vendors will adopt that in yep. their switches. So my question is, how easy would it be to uh, integrate or to build a network with uh, switches from different vendors? Okay, good point. So Incenter will be the main contact point. Right? So OpenFlow is open. It will not be open, but it, it is already open. You can create already your own controllers if you want. Um, the thing is, you have the extension tables on the actions, right? So if, if, if they stick to the most four actions, then every vendor like Juniper, Cisco, HP, you can deploy the open flow switches and you can do the open, you can do the open stuff. But inside the protocol, there is an ability to build your own application and modify your own extensions. And that's where you need to go in the end to InCenter if, if you want to do that interoperability vendor testing. So if they stick to Let's say the, if the application is stick to the four default actions, then it will not be a problem. And every vendor needs to implement that. The current version is one. They're working on 2.0 protocol. Is there other question? Thanks. Uh, how do you solve uh, security in a command center? Because uh, it looks like uh, that the command center is a powerful tool, and if the wrong person gain access to it, uh, it could be the network god. Okay, so may, will I repeat the question? So the, the, the question was, how are we going to solve security inside the network? So first of all, um, with OpenFlow, we can set security, right? So we can set ACLs, and we can set multiple attributes. So we can also set to a certain flow, what it can or can't do and configure them dynamically in the network. If a user moves or roams with mobile, for example, the policy will move with the user. So that's an advantage. So that way you can also set the public cloud and the private cloud um, interoperability, right? And deploy really uh, secure services inside a public cloud, for example, to a certain user. The other point is that we are looking into sensors, for example, and sensors inside switching that can do certain uh, security for us, right? That, that, that can be an evolution. And if you can combine that with OpenFlow, for example, you have a complete solution where you can also configure the sensors. Other questions? Yes. Um, well, um, can a um, state like Iran or Syria, can use your technology for Oh, okay. Uh, to censorship the internet, you said you can disconnect data streams, so if they would work with the big carrier, they can just say, okay, let's disconnect it, and it seems to be now very easy. So, is it possible, yes or no? It, it, first of all, it is possible. You can even say to a flow, four to zero ports. So, um, you can disconnect, or you can say four to zero port, for example. What you can do is, if you configure it at that time, um, it will be automatically put inside the TCAM, configured inside the ASIC. So then the flow can go nowhere. Other questions? Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for coming over. Have a safe trip home. Yeah, we'll make you. a five minutes break and then you will see here uh, Mr. 
James Avala, Joam, Joam Avala from Spain, and he will talk about the Lost Project e-learning for security trainers. So stay in five minutes break.